you've asked me to share some some personal reflections on nonlinear analysis of concrete structures and, and also to talk uh, perhaps a little more broadly around their coverage in design standards. And, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to do that. So thank you. Um, and my objective this evening is to provide some background and context um, in a way that's complementary for the more detailed presentations that are going to follow from Jan and from Carl. Um, and what I certainly acknowledge is that this is a complex field and, and one where detail matters. Um, but I will remain at a more general level in my presentation and talk mostly about principles and concepts. And as I've said, to share some, some personal experiences or draw some personal experiences, some of which you know, err towards some slightly cautionary tales, um, because I guess over the past 30 years, um, where I've had an interest in this field, I've, I've learned quite a lot and some interesting lessons, I think, and I want to share some of those experiences with you. So as I've alluded to, um, I first became interested in this field almost 30 years ago. It's sort of slightly depressing when you, when you work out how long ago it was. Um, and at the time, at the start of my career, there was a lot of work being done on the assessment of existing structures, particularly the assessment of existing bridges. And, and there was quite a consistent mismatch between how these structures were clearly performing in practice and the assessment ratings that we were arriving at through analysis, that, that we would find structures that seemed to be performing um, perfectly adequately having assessment ratings that suggested that they were somehow substandard. And I was, I was really intrigued by this. And the focus there very much was on their safety, ultimate limit state. And, and I think at the time, um, I'd assumed that in the future, these issues would be settled by nonlinear numerical methods, nonlinear finite elements analysis. And it was really a question of, of computing power, that that's what, that's what we needed in order to be able to move from the techniques that we were applying at the time to, to be able to model these structures more accurately. And, and over the past 30 years, a lot has changed. And, um, and we you know, think in the context of, of, sort of Moore's law or his prediction around, around computing power, which has, which has held pretty true around the, you know, the doubling of computing power every few years. And, and um, so certainly computing power has transformed but actually, the way in which we approach the assessment of structures like this hasn't changed nearly so radically um, over the past 30 years. Now, I got interested in this, I guess, particularly um, when I did my PhD, uh, which again, I suppose is 25 years ago now. Um, and I was exploring the question around that mismatch between our assessment ratings and, and the, the real performance of, of concrete slabs I particularly focused on. And the work I did at the time had uh, experimental elements, it had theoretical elements, it had numerical elements. And in fact, I, I developed from scratch um, my own nonlinear finite element type code to be able to make predictions. And, um, uh, and there's something I think very instructive around developing code like that from scratch. And you can kind of tell how old it was because the whole thing was coded in Fortran, but it was, um, for me, it was very, very instructive. And I think, you know, whilst the, the results of my um, PhD are probably not too significant, um, for me personally, the education of them, and I think it's true of most research degrees, actually the most important thing is the education and certainly the education that I gained and the insights I gained through developing from scratch those nonlinear analysis tools, um, I certainly found very instructive and they've informed um, what some of what I'm going to talk about this evening, and they certainly informed uh, the work that I've done over the last 25 years or so. And and whilst you know at WSP uh, we use nonlinear finite elements analysis and we use other numerical methods and other advanced analysis tools a lot, um, uh, and there's absolutely no question that for some problems they are really invaluable. I guess I always approach their application asking myself a few key questions, and today. You know, I wanted to walk through, I guess, some backgrounds and some thoughts in this area um, to share with you um, some of those questions that I find valuable um, when I'm looking at using nonlinear analysis tools. So, so today I want to start off talking a bit around the objectives of analysis. Uh, I, I've been asked to talk a little bit around the sort of standards context, and I'm going to give you a very, very quick overview of what's happening in terms of the evolution of Eurocodes, and then particularly to talk around um, the coverage anticipated on nonlinear numerical methods. 
I then want to talk a little bit around limit analysis and concrete structures, and then I will I will conclude just by sharing with you some of those key questions that I tend to have in mind um, when I'm thinking about, as I said, the application of, of um, nonlinear numerical methods to concrete structures. So as I said, I'm going to start off talking about the objectives of analysis, and and I think that um, you know in its simplest terms, you know I think it is always vital to have a very clear understanding or focus on what the objective of analysis is at the outset and you know the first question very often is is why are you doing it and and sort of in the vertical axis of this of this diagram you know it tends to be that that sometimes we're doing it to promote our understanding or to build our understanding about a structure or sometimes it's about prediction so, so we might do it to aid our understanding in a research context, or if we're dealing with some highly complex detail or element where we want to test the behavior, or perhaps we want to undertake some kind of parametric exploration around a, a set of test results, you know, which might sit very much in that understanding area. But sometimes when we're doing design, or, or the example I started with, where we're assessing the load carrying capacity of an existing structure, then it's really all about prediction. And it's about having a result uh, that we can use in our design or assessment ratings. So that's one axis. And then the other axis here is about what's most important about the result. And we might naturally think that the most important thing is accuracy. But I guess one of the things that I've learned is that actually sometimes it feels quite right to trade some of that accuracy if a result you get greater confidence that the result is on the safe side. And I think this was this was really brought home to me uh, in work that I did on developing design rules for FRP strengthening of structures. And, and I wanted to sort of share a little bit of a story with you here. Um, and I guess this was probably in the in the sort of early 2000s when when I was doing this work. And at the time we were engaged in in research work and development of design rules and, and best practice guides, and most importantly, you know, some early pioneering projects around FRP strengthening of concrete structures. And one of the areas we we're looking at was strengthening bridge piers using FRP. And at the time I was attending conferences, and they tended to be about every six months, there would be a, um, a major international conference and people would come along and they would talk about their latest models and the latest test results looking at strengthening um, rectangular elements using using FRP. And, uh, and for me, it was almost sort of comical sequence I observed over a series of conferences um, where, where people would arrive um, and they would present their latest test data to add to, to the kind of global database of test results. And they would present their new model, which would be uh, partially calibrated or they're often there's some empirical factor and it'd be calibrated against the um, that database of test results and what they would show was that the coefficient of variation that they got from their model was slightly better than the coefficient of variation when they applied the model that was presented by somebody else six months before and, and in a way it wasn't that surprising because they they provided they used some kind of empirical calibration and of course they've done that with a few more data points um, and so no surprise that their coefficient of variation was slightly reduced and, and there was a sense that that was progress and that the, the quality of the work was judged by, by accuracy. But what I was very conscious of designing projects was that I wasn't really interested in accuracy, I was interested in confidence. Um, I wanted to know that what we were designing was safe. Uh, and whilst we clearly mustn't be profligate with our use of materials, um, and particularly these days, you know, recognizing the you know, net zero ambitions that we have and, and, and that we need to be cautious around the way in which we use materials and we shouldn't use them inefficiently, safety must be our overriding obligation. And um, so, so I developed a design approach um, which has plenty of flaws, but it had a particular objective um, that it was it built from the underlying principles, the underlying mechanics, to end up with something that we could have confidence in, and and, and elements of that approach have, have remained. But I think what I what I really took away from that 
was this this distinction that actually in quite a lot of situations what we're really interested in is prediction and prediction that we can have confidence in and um and i think it's helpful to highlight that because you know we certainly see nonlinear tools being used and being used very effectively in, in a very worthwhile way for other purposes um and uh, and sometimes i see debate and criticism around um these different applications and i think you know often it's because they are trying to answer different questions and it's important to recognize that but similarly we have to be a little cautious not to then just infer that because nonlinear tools may be extremely helpful in gaining greater understanding um that that doesn't necessarily mean that we can sleep happily at night that the predictions we would get we can rely on in terms of confidence and 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 um Jan and Carl will talk later around you know uh, situations where they've applied these tools very very effectively and so I'm not seeking in any way to um uh belittle this um or, or what's possible but it's simply to sort of probe that question around um what what are we seeking and if we're seeking prediction and we're seeking confidence then we need to be clear that that's what we're doing and i, and I think that in a, in a non-linear numerical methods of, con of concrete structures context um you know here we might be thinking particularly around um the behavior of concrete intention um which we know is is brittle it's you know it, as, as jan will show in later slides it, it has a fracture energy so it's not it's not you know absolutely brittle um, but it's uh, it's a fairly brittle uh, behavior and and we've certainly undertaken checks and reviews of others work where we found that there's been a very high level of reliance on the tensile strength of concrete and that's raised um, concerns for us and I think that you know the significance of that was actually really brought home to me with the collapse of the De La Concorde bridge in Montreal in 2006 and and the point that I wanted to draw out uh from that situation was that after that happened there were some full-scale model tests done of the um of the structure and uh, and there were tests done on the as designed configuration and also tests done on the as constructed configuration and and what for me was really noteworthy was that it was clear that the as constructed configuration when it was tested was still significantly stronger than the structure must have been when it collapsed from the analysis of the loading that was on it at the time and, and i think that the reason why you can have that difference is because when that model was tested full-scale model was tested the concrete intention clearly would have been working but it seems likely that there had been a progressive loss of that a progressive propagation of some kind of crack within the structure that meant that that, that uh, element of the load carrying capacity had been lost over time. And of course it isn't, it isn't reclaimed at any point. Um, and so a real, you know, one has to ask these questions around if I'm looking at things that behave in a brittle fashion, you know, can I have confidence that I won't have lost an element of that, of that um, load carrying capacity um, through some kind of, you know, aging long-term effect, some kind of gradual loss of that. Um, and as I said, I think that that De La Concorde result a failure, but more the testing afterwards, you know, really brought that home to me. Let me move on then um, and, uh, and just talk in terms of the Euro codes and I'm conscious of time here. So I'm not going to dwell on this too heavily. Um, but Owen, as Owen's alluded to, we're currently in the process of developing the second generation of the Euro codes. And this is a huge program in the, 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 the um, uh, you know, it's a privileged role that I have in in leading this overall effort and 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 it's always very daunting when you recognize that it's going to impact something like half a million engineers across Europe and around the world and it is the largest standardization program by funding level ever from the European Commission um, and and we're sort of a healthy way through this now we've got four overlapping phases we've concluded phase one phase two is concluding this year and phases two and three will conclude next year um, when these project team phases conclude there is still quite a lot of work to do to finalize the documents before they go through their inquiry and formal vote processes but but as i said we're, we're, we're quite a long way through the work um and and later in uh you know probably around 24 uh into 25 we'll see the last of the new 
uh, documents made available to national standards bodies. Um, uh, so I said, we're well into this. And, and we set ourselves very clearly two overarching objectives for the evolution of the Eurocodes. The first is to enhance ease of use, and the second is to achieve exemplary levels of international consensus. And in the context of what we're talking about this evening, I wanted to particularly draw out some points about enhanced ease of use. And what we did at the outset of this program uh, was to bring together an international group to define what we meant by enhanced ease of use. And, and their work uh, was then translated into a position paper that was unanimously endorsed by the 34 um, uh, member states of, of SEN. And, um, uh, and that paper set out five pillars that would, follow, would essentially define our approach. And the first of those was to create a system of statements of intent to meet users' needs. And, and this is the point that I wanted to draw out this evening. I think when you're writing any document, uh, it's important to be to have a clear understanding of, of who your target audience is. And so with the work on the Eurocodes, we've sought to achieve that um, and defined our primary target audience as, as practitioners, competent engineers. So we're defining that as competent civil structural and geotechnical engineers, typically qualified professionals able to work independently in relevant fields. And, you know, I think um, it was quite an early lesson for me in, in, in trying to build international consensus just what a struggle it was to arrive at, at a vocabulary that all countries could live with here. Um, but I do find this a useful definition. And I think particularly that point about working independently, you know, I think that's obviously a, a, you know, a milestone in all of our careers when we, when we feel we're in a position to do that um, rather than under close supervision. And I think that, that that's helpful in terms of a definition. But, but the point that I particularly wanted to draw out is around the statements of intent and we actually identified around 10 or 11 different user groups for the Eurocodes, um, for whom all of for whom all all of whom uh, we wrote statements of intent for. Um, but there were two that I wanted to draw out this evening. You know, for our primary target audience, those practitioners, competent engineers, we've defined that we'll aim to produce standards that are suitable and clear for all common design cases. And then importantly to say without demanding disproportionate levels of effort to apply them. And I think some of the things that we're talking about tonight, you know, are, are complex tools and they do take a lot of effort. And, and actually within the standard, we do want to have, you know, suitable and clear and relatively straightforward tools um, and analysis methods that are available to deal with common design cases. But the other one I wanted to draw out was around expert specialists. And our statement of intent for expert specialists is we will aim not to restrict innovation by providing freedom to experts to apply their specialist knowledge and expertise. And that's where I think, um, you know, the, the, the point around some of the nonlinear numerical methods we'll talk about this evening is really important. And it's really important that, that standards are not seen as a barrier to the application of um, sophisticated numerical tools. And, and particularly because I think as we, as we move through the forthcoming years, you know, I'm very keen that the Eurocodes are, you know, enable and support the possibilities of design assisted by testing, whether that testing is physical testing or numerical testing. Um, but there is a little bit of a balance to strike here because, you know, certainly I've had conversations with people around the coverage of numerical methods within standards. And sometimes people, you know, who are expert in that field um, feel that they're, they're subject area, their specialist area is underrepresented. And I often find myself saying to them, but I think you need to be a little careful what you wish for here. Because the problem with writing things in standards sometimes is that actually you tend to sort of bake things in and it can reduce flexibility rather than building it. And um, so there is certainly a balance to strike here. And we are currently working to try to land in the right place in relation to that balance. And um, so so we've established an ad hoc group which is looking at so it's examining and working to promote consistency with the coverage of numerical methods across the codes um, and it's a natural point in time for us to do that because the drafting work of the second generation has reached a level of maturity that we can make those comparisons across the various different uh, developing parts and there are a few themes that are emerging um, one which is really important is around the non-linear safety format um, the safety format the partial partial factor method 
um, that are the, the sort of at the heart of, of the Eurocode design approach or most commonly used elements of the Eurocode design approach um, are very well suited to, to situations where applying linear analysis. Um, but there are some complex, complexities around nonlinear uh, analysis. And I know Jan's going to talk about this in detail, so I won't dwell on that other than just to emphasize just how important this is. Um, but then we're also looking at whether there are common requirements that can be transferred into EN 1990, the basis of design document. But recognizing that, that actually the challenges um, in terms of analysis for the different materials covered by the Eurocodes are quite different. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in, in concrete structures, we tend to be dealing with geometric, um, with material nonlinearity, obviously with steel structures, you know, often dealing with both um, geometric and material nonlinearity, um, and uh, and if we're looking at you know, geotechnical situations, then um, uh, a host of different other things come into play. So um, you know, so recognizing that the coverage will vary between the different Eurico parts, but again, trying to provide some of that common platform and linkage. Um, but I did want to share this with you, and particularly share with you that background because I think that it is um, uh, it's helpful for you to understand that because as we um, as the the new editions of the Eurocodes move through their their inquiry and formal vote processes, then then some of you hopefully will take the opportunity to engage in in the review of those drafts. And I think that um, one of the things that hopefully you'll take away from from what I've said this evening uh, is that recognition that um, one has to think around the depth of coverage to 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 have in more specialist areas um, because. We don't want to inhibit experts from from applying their expertise, and there is a little bit of a risk. So I said that if you bake too much in, you actually can constrain. But moving on, there's another element um, that I wanted to touch on, and that's that's um, and this is probably best handled with a with an example. Um, and and having uh, done quite a lot of training, uh, one of the questions that I often ask people uh, is um, is when they apply a a linear analysis to a structure um, when it's quite clear if you test a concrete structure that it will typically start behaving elastically then move into a nonlinear behavior um, that asks them the question well if you were assessing a bridge slab say you know what kind of analysis would you do and people would say well i'd do a, a grillage or an elastic finite element analysis and i'll say to them but if the behavior is nonlinear, how can you be confident that you're right how can you be confident that um uh, that your results are on the safe side. How do you sleep at night doing that? And you um, you get people looking a little nervous, and then I probe it a little bit, and I say, no, seriously, how do you sleep at night around this? And I'll push some questions, and 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 I'll typically get a range of answers, and some will be not good answers, like that's what safety factors are for, which isn't really true, or that's what we've always done, or that's what the code says, which that's not great answers, and. And eventually, we'll typically land on on something around the lower bound theorem and this idea that that if we can find a distribution of stresses through a structure that's everywhere in equilibrium, the applied load doesn't violate the yield condition, that can be safely carried. And that's the sometimes called the safe load theorem. I sometimes think of it as the why we can sleep at night theorem. Um, and um, and this has some really important and useful corollaries. And we see these within standards. So one of the corollaries is that states of self-stress, self-equilibrating stress systems within a structure um, don't affect the ultimate limit state. Um, and, and that's why you see in the Eurocodes things like the clauses in the N 1992 that say that thermal actions can be ignored at ULS subject to satisfying some certain conditions. But what I tend to do, which then makes people even more com uncomfortable sometimes when we're talking about this, is to note that actually that theorem only applies if four conditions are satisfied. And I'll kind of give you a pass on the first two because they're kind of more theoretical, but the next two are really important. And if we had more time, I'd pause a little bit now and ask you to think about it and wonder if they're at your fingertips because because these really matter. You know, th there is quite a reliance within our standards and our approaches on this lower bound theorem. It's quite kind of baked into our psyche, I think, when we're analysing things. But there are two, as I said, two further conditions that are really important. One about ductility and the other about small deflections. And I often contrast these with two trends that we see in structural design, which is the greater use of high strength materials and 
the use of more complex geometries. And there's clearly a linkage here between ductility being lost as we use higher strength materials and small deflections, by which we mean the equilibrium conditions don't uh, change um, uh, as the structure deflects, you know, not applying in these more complex geometries. And what this means is that we can't rely on the lower bound theorem as much, and we do need to use um, numerical methods. But um, I think what where this leads me also to is to recognize that if we've got questions around ductility or small deflections, it's really important that we, you know, that we recognize that and understand that and understand to what extent they are going to influence the analysis. So that takes us through to, and rushing that somewhat, takes us through to these key questions. Um, questions that I think it's healthy to ask yourself. So, so a question about the safety factor format to be used, and I'll leave it to Jan to talk about that. Uh, a question of is there availability of comparable experience and test data? Um, and again, I think Jan will touch on this, and I think it's a, again really important area that there is a difference between interpolating or testing sensitivity around a test result and just, if you like, applying a sophisticated nonlinear tool blind. And then as I've sort of been touching on, there's questions around how sensitive is the result to a brittle material behavior, like the tensile strength of concrete point I was making earlier, or, or how sensitive is the result to geometric nonlinearity. And, and if that sensitivity is high, it tends to mean that, um, that numerically things are a little bit less stable, and, um, and certainly physically they're almost certainly less stable, and they're really important to understand. Also need to think about boundary conditions. You know, if initial stress states matter if we're dealing with with brittle materials or geometric nonlinearity. We often ignore those uh, in conventional design. We need to think about those, and we need to think harder around boundary conditions. And then a final point, just in terms of solution strategies and whether we're interested in ascending branches or descending branches. But I certainly think it's often very interesting to get a full sense of the response of a structure and. Sometimes that steers you away from some of the simpler solution strategies one can apply. So that gets me to the end of what I wanted to share. And, and, and I hope that there are a few elements there that are useful. As I said, I think I hand over to Jan and, and, and Carl, who'll talk about um, some really, you know, some detailed analyses. Um, but as I said, I do hope that's helpful for you, just perhaps in having some of those tests in mind, those questions in mind, uh, as you're contemplating, contemplating applying um, nonlinear methods. And with that, oh, and let me hand back to you. Um, so just picking up on one of the questions that's come through, this is from uh, Costas Geolopoulos. Hi, Costas, nice to have you with us. Um, and he's asked, isn't the objective of analysis simply to feed design with stress resultants? And of course, at, and of course, the attributes of the analysis are the ones shown on the slide. So, Steve, does that question make sense to you? Yeah, look, I think I think it's I think that's a fair observation. But I, but I do think the the way you know where you deploy those or how you deploy those um, does make a difference. That you're, you know, whilst you undertake your analysis to get a set of results, you know, there there are situations where, you know, certainly from a a research perspective, I was interested in trying to follow the 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 um, low deflection response of the structures I was analysing as as closely as possible. But as I've alluded to, when I was designing something. Um, I was very, very interested in something safe-sided, and, and perhaps to to um, uh, give a little bit of an example around that. I remember um, uh, I remember a really instructive conversation I had with with um, uh, actually a very eminent uh, person, very involved in FIB work, uh, called Peter Marty, who who I think is a you know just absolutely fabulous uh, structural engineer and an academic uh, from Switzerland. And uh, and I was talking to him. He's a you know absolutely amazing work in in the field of plasticity uh, theory. And um, and I was talking to him about the use of FRP in brittle materials and my PhD on ductility questions. And he said to me, "Yes, these things are all interesting. But actually, what I'm more interested in is finding ways to design structures so that they are predictable and so that they are ductile." And I thought it just brought a very different perspective, which I thought was really, really instructive of saying, well, rather than spend your time trying to analyze complicated structures, why not design them so that they behave in a more predictable way? Um, so, so Costas, I think your, you know, your, your, your point's an interesting one, but I think there is more at our disposal as designers, you know, simply than plugging things into the analysis and then acting on the, on the outcomes from that. 